pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioner Maine? I'm here. Oh, good. Hi, Bob. So, Hello. Commissioner Maine is joining us by phone, and we will go ahead and get started. Um, we have nobody signed up for public comment this morning? No? All right. If you change your mind, let me know. And we will move on. Our first agenda item is Department Head's uh, Coleman Arm Nutrient Project for Blue Green Algae, 10 Mile Lakes Basin Partnership. Dr. Whitney? Uh, Alan Whitney. Uh, I represent Ten Mile Lakes as president of, of the uh, Ten Mile Lakes Association. I just want to make a brief comment that uh, Ten Mile Lakes is an extremely important lake in Oregon. It's uh, years ago it was the second most recreated lake in Oregon. Uh, in the last 20 some years, we've been inundated with blue green algae, limiting yeah. uh, recreation for several times. The lake has been closed due to uh, blue green algae problems. We've tried to address this with uh, septic treatments and septic uh, treatments. And uh, we also uh, were in the process of getting Ten Mile, Lake, Ten Mile Creek uh, restoration for fish and um, improving the lake level. Uh, we, uh, several nutrient uh, factors. Ten Mile Lakes Basin Partnership has uh, done a lot to uh, reduce the sedimentation uh, with the upland ag fencing and uh, culvert uh, removal with uh, bridging uh, to reduce the animal activity. But uh, we still have uh, blue-green algae, which is a big problem because uh, many of the uh, residents take water from the lake uh, for their domestic use. Um, and uh, North Bend Cufe Water Board also is, still has uh, recreate rights to the water in the lake, um, although they've not exercised that uh, at this point. Um, we have looked into treatments for blue-green algae. Uh, I have a list here. Uh, Richard Litz has uh, done some research in that area. I've talked to a number of companies. And right now, our favorite is CISBIO. Uh, we have the representative from CISBIO here, an international company that's treated, in most of the places have not treated lakes as big as Ten Mile Lake. And we are looking at a project to start uh, Coleman Arm to see if it works for our lake um, as a small area, then hopefully if that works to expand that elsewhere. Uh, possibly uh, get some grant funding to fund some of this. Uh, but there's ongoing costs associated with the uh, power for the uh, bubbler, for their radar machines or whatever yeah. they want to call them. And um, also ongoing uh, treatments to the lake, which Mr. Dave Shackleton here will explain. And Great. I'll leave the, to him. Perfect. Do you want to introduce the group that's with you? You've got a pretty esteemed group going here. Okay. <laughs> I have Richard Litz, uh, Mike May uh, from Tribe and uh, Oregon Lakes Association, Matt, sorry, and um, Richard, uh, Michael, Mike Mater, and we have all the tribe here, the chief, the chief, and several of their board members, public board council members. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourselves really quick? Thank you so much for joining us. And it's all yours now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the name's Dave Shackleton. Uh, SIS Bio is an international company. Clean Flow is, we acquired Clean Flow uh, about four years ago 
after working with them for 10 years in the US, so we're basically one and the same now. <coughs> I just want to give you a brief description of kind of what happens in a healthy lake and how it deteriorates, and how many of the treatments that uh, people go about uh, trying to mitigate the symptoms actually make the problem worse over time. <coughs> so typically, you have an inflow of nutrients, mostly nitrogen and phosphate. If you want your lawn to grow, you put nitrogen and phosphate in there, you know, ammonia, ammonium nitrate, phosphate, and so on. It is what nourishes vegetative growth. So <coughs> with that inflow, you will get a proliferation of weeds and a proliferation of algae. <coughs> uh, as long as the water is fully oxygenated, the fish have access to the full water column. And so the fish are you know, growing, you have a productive food chain, and you have nutrients coming in, you have nutrients going into weed and algae, which hopefully are remain in balance with the food chain and the fish, and that food chain as predators prey on, on the higher members of the food chain, you have a clearance of nutrients. And so if you have a biological balance, you have a sustainable, healthy lake. What happens is, <coughs> with these increased uh, inflows, the weeds die off, they decompose into, in, into the bottom and form more sediment. The algae dies off, goes down into the sediment and decomposes. So you start getting an accumulation of a stockpile of nutrients at the bottom. <coughs> then what happens is you get what they call a stratification of the water column. So at the bottom, you have a stagnant, cooler, deoxygenated water, and it's only oxygenated at the top. So when that happens, the fish can't survive down in the lower portion because there's no oxygen there. So you cut off a big proportion of the water from being accessible to and being able to sustain a productive food chain. So you cut off your clearance of nutrients, and then you get a continuing accumulation of nutrients, and the fish can only operate at the top. So typically the sort of treatment that people have adopted, <coughs> particularly on the East Coast, is herbicides. So we've got too many weeds, we go and kill, kill, the, uh, kill the weeds. Well, they die off into the bottom, decompose, and you increase that sediment. Right. Similarly with algicides. We go and kill the algae, the algae dies off, goes to the bottom, increases the sediment. So you're making the, the situation worse. Uh, <coughs> chemical precipitants. So people will focus on the phosphorus, which is the P up there, and there are certain chemicals like alum and uh, there are other sort of proprietary ones <coughs> that lock onto the phosphorus and take it down to the bottom. Well, you know, all you've done is put it down at the bottom. So <coughs> this is how you, you tend over time then to have more and more weeds, more and more algae. When people talk of invasive weeds, it's not so much invasive weeds, it's invasive muck. And that muck provides a nutrient-rich rooting bed that the weeds follow. So you know, it's the muck invasion and the weeds following rather than, than, than the weeds invasion as such. Aeration is, is uh, something that's often being put forward. Most of the aeration technologies come from companies that have spent years managing you know, garden ponds, small ponds, shallow ponds, and so on. They don't, they're, they're not appropriate for larger bodies of water and, and lakes and so on. <coughs> One of the reasons, and you can kind of understand it intuitively, is the bubble when it forms at the bottom is, is very small. It expands as, as it moves up the water column because there's less water pressure. So the amount of oxygen transfer that you get at the bottom is negligible. What actually happens is up at the top is, is where you get the, <coughs> the oxygenation, but you, you know, it's typically already oxygenated up there. You also, you've got a turbulent flow there, so often what happens is you stir up nutrients and you stir up the sediment that makes the situation worse. <coughs> These are a couple of uh, clips, and hopefully you'll be able to hear it, from a webinar from a company supplying exactly this sort of equipment. And there's two questions asked. I think the first one is whether it helps with weeds. And the other is, they basically say, you know, if you 
not there just to make things worse. And that's exactly what has happened often. Does aeration or nano bubbles help with aquatic weed control? I'm gonna send this one over to Shannon. Josh, um, not directly. Um, higher dissolved oxygen levels in the water body do reduce the quantity of available nutrients, but if you have an established weed in them, the plants will still be able to get enough nutrients from the sediment to grow. So um, aeration wouldn't be a good method of weed control. So that's exactly it. Unless you're able to address the sediment, you, you, you don't have too small of an aeration system. Um, as we discussed, the water at the bottom of the pond tends to have poor water quality down near the sediment. It's got less oxygen, it's got a lot of nutrients in it. So if you use too small of an aeration system, it will bring that poor quality water up and mix it in with the rest of the water column. But if you're not getting adequate circulation to continually move the entire water body and turn it over, frequently enough, then you can actually cause more harm than good. So, you know, with, with that little bit of an understanding, what people do, and, and uh, Alan made reference to it earlier then, you say, well, let's try and stop nutrient inflows. So you're working on your storm water and, and the various other things you mentioned. The fact of the matter is, you know, that's too little too late and ineffective because you have a self-sustaining system now with the nutrient stockpile that's already in the lake. <coughs> so, <coughs> if this is the situation that we have, and I, I was out on the lake last, uh, yesterday, and you, you can see that uh, there's invasive weeds. <coughs> when you have an anaerobic bottom, your nitrogen is present as ammonia. Ammonia is a nitrogen source for the bluebeam, for the cyanobacteria. <coughs> your normal algae and so on can't, can't process ammonia. So you've got something that favors cyanobacteria once you have this, this, this sort of situation in place. <coughs> the other thing that the cyanobacteria can do is they, they actually have gas vesicles in their cells that they can deflate at night to go down, stock up on the nutrients. They then inflate again and come up to the top and, and bloom. <coughs> so the fact that you've got nutrients that favor them at the bottom means they're able to navigate a stratified water column. And we were there, we were out yesterday, we were taking measurements, the water column isn't really stratified yet. But give it another month or so, in the warm weather, once it gets stratified, then you have a situation where the cyanobacteria can move in and dominate. And they can go up and down, up and down, <coughs> and so you'll get more and more of them and far less of the green algae. <coughs> so, with that understanding, you can say that a <coughs> kind of specify a solution. What you want to see in the solution is, firstly, you need to de-stratify and re-oxygenate the water column. That, that stops mm -hmm. the cyanobacteria from moving down, <coughs> uh, up and down. It also changes your nitrogen from ammonia to nitrate, so you've got a chemical change there. Blocks them going up and down. So you, you're systematically kind of preventing them <coughs> from dominating the nutrient uptake. You need to see a digestion of the sediment so we can get rid of that accumulated nu uh, nutrient stockpile that, that is providing the self-fueling uh, system. And then lastly, the thing you want to see is nutrient clearance. So you want to see an improvement in the general biology, but particularly the fish life and the predators on the fish, so you know that you are, over time, getting the net cl uh, clearance. And in order to do that, you need to have a fully oxygenated water column so that So with that, I just want to run through to show you we have done this, and we've done this in a variety of climates at a variety of altitudes on lakes as small as, well, single digits or 50, 60, 100 acres, but up to water bodies that are 1,800 acres, uh, 5,000 acres, one we did, and so on. So it's scalable. This is temperature, uh, top and bottom. 30 foot deep lake, which is similar to, to 10 mile. And you'll see when we start our system up, you actually have a 22 degree difference. That's the stratification. And that's what allows the sign of bacteria to navigate up and down that water column. 
that's six weeks, and that's 10 weeks, and within 10 weeks, we've got the EP stratified, we've taken that out. This is the same body of water, and this is the dissolved oxygen. You want a minimum of, of five. We've got measurements here at the bottom, the middle, and the top in the 30 foot, so it's, it's, it's 30 feet deep, 15 feet deep in the surface. And you'll see beforehand, from 15 feet down, there's absolutely no oxygen. You want a minimum of five, six weeks, 10 weeks. We have more at the bottom, 5.9, than we had at the top to start with, and we've raised the dissolved oxygen throughout the water column. So now you've created an environment in which we can do the rest of the work. <coughs> if you look, and, and I, this is where I, I urge uh, you know, people like Richard to do the research and look, the aeration companies, and they have these case studies on their websites, they're talking a water body 20 feet deep, and they're saying that they achieved uh, dissolved oxygen levels, but they're only showing you to 12 feet. Well, that straight away has to be a question mark. The other thing is, it took them nine months to achieve it, and they achieved it in April, which is when you have your normal lake turnover. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all the question marks there that a diligent researcher will, will be picking up. This is some people that phoned us and said, we put in an aeration system from a company, and they're performing on all the criteria they've given us, but, uh, you know, the lake's not getting any better. Now, if you look at what they've done, they've said their target minimum dissolved oxygen is two. Well, two just inadequate. You, know, you need at least five for it to be aerobic for the fish to be able to get across. <coughs> and so, you know, they put in this false low hurdle. And yet, the funny thing is that a lot of the time they don't even they don't even meet that that low hurdle. <coughs> the only time they do is in October when you have a natural turnover, and in April May when you have a natural turnover. So, if, if you analyze this stuff, it's uh, you can see it here by contrast is one we did in New York. This is in June. You can see from 15 feet down, it's, it's below five. This is where we commissioned. We're eight, nine weeks later, and we have it. That's rapid acting, and, and, and that, that's what's in radar technology. Rapid acting, de-stratification, oxygen restoration technology. <coughs> this then is measuring dissolved oxygen in the sediment itself. So we put a probe into the sediment. Beforehand, th there's nothing. It's a mucky, foul, black sediment. Once it's oxygenated, that allows us then to put enzymes in which will actively digest that. Here's an example of that. So <coughs> we do, like we did yesterday, we do a bathymetric survey where we get a detailed profile of the bottom of the bottom of the lake. <coughs> this the yellow thing is the 14-foot contour here. So anything there is 14 feet or deeper, and you can see there were just two small small spots in the lake that were 14 feet or deeper. Uh, that was in 2017. In 2019, that's the, the other thing. You can see how, much, how we've digested and deepened the lake and taken out that sediment. What we can do is draw a transect there and flip that up 90 degrees, and you'll see that is the profile of the bottom before. This is the profile two, two years in. At the deepest point, we've gone from 16 feet down to 20 feet. Uh, this is for weeds and algae, that's a before and after picture. Similar sort of thing here, by digesting, and this is a statistically, scientifically done uh, quantification of the weeds, but as we digest the sediment, we remove the mucky stuff that allows the invasive weeds to invade and, and get control of that. This is just your normal green algae. The lake at the moment has got a lot of green algae. We will bring that uh, under control over time. This, out of interest, it doesn't seem to be a problem, but coliforms, uh, E. coli, often is, is a problem. Uh, they need to be kept below, kept below 300. <coughs> this is a beach that was shut virtually all summer because there's a wastewater treatment plant upstream that wasn't compliant, and so there was E. coli accumulated in the beach area. Uh, we commissioned the system on 19th of July. Within three or four days, we have it under control. Then they had a massive storm that flushes out the sewage treatment plant. That's what happened to the E. coli. And again, within a matter of days, we have it under control until the next storm. So now they just shut it two or three days after it's been a big storm event, and it's open the rest of the time. 
This just shows you a situation where there were 4.8 million cells per mil. That's how much algae there was uh, in this particular pond. And it was all cyanobacteria. And 99.9% of it was a toxic microcystis. <coughs> now, what we, what a big part of what we're trying to do is rebalance the system, bring in more biodiversity, and bring in the algae that will be provided through substrate to preserve plankton, but there's a boost for the fish and, and regenerate the biology. <coughs> so here you'll see, not too long afterwards, we've completely eliminated the cyanobacteria, and we're starting to get a whole lot of new species come up as, as we develop that biodiversity and uh, improve the food chain. <coughs> this is, uh, we can give you the case study. This is New York DEC data. <coughs> this is a lake which was, it was only open to the public for five days in 2017. And these are the blue green algae levels, and you can see they completely dominate the, the phytoplankton in the lake. We commissioned this in June 2018. You can see the improvement. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's 2019, where we've got way more biodiversity, cyanobacteria under control. Wasn't shut for a single day. We only have one uh, set of data for this year so far, but we have zero cyanobacteria, zero has. <coughs> the ultimate uh, kind of test, as far as we're concerned, is an improvement in the bird life, improvement or in the, in the fish life, and the birds of prey that are preying on those fish. So this is what we did in Colorado, uh, commissioned early 2018. At the end of last year, this post was put up by the president of the Colorado Ornithological Society. And I, I, we can give you these documents, but he basically says that uh, the last two winters in particular, thanks to the system installed in uh, Warren Lake, it has become a mecca for rare gulls, birds from all over Colorado and other states as well are coming in to see all these different things. We asked him if he would actually put that into a more formal lecture, which he has done. Uh, and I think he adds, adds in there that uh, they've got up to 300 diving ducks, 30 bald eagles, they stay through winter and so on. So there you can see the, the, a complete improvement in, in the biology. So it's not just controlling the sign of bacteria. It's a complete regeneration and rejuvenation of the lake. Thank you. Question? So this is an enzyme and aeration system? Is that what yep. you're looking at? <coughs> we, we, we do three things. One, one, we manage the dissolved oxygen and stratification. Two enzymes actively digest the, uh, the sediment. And then we put in kind of mi micronutrients and stimulants to stimulate the zooplankton food chain so that we okay. have lots of competition for the algae and cyanobacteria. Okay. And we're able to get that down. To try to speed up the process. Sorry? To, sorry, to try to speed up the process of what would happen naturally otherwise. Yeah. yeah. I've noted the previous uh, demonstrations, he's also said it's improved the uh, fish habitat considerably in oh, the fishing sure. and other lakes. That's true, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. No, we've so about the lake, Ten Mile Lakes is a big fishing thing. used to be salmon, now it's primarily bass and uh, but uh, by improving the nutrients, uh, the fishing apparently improves yeah. considerably. Yeah. yeah, that would that would make sense. What about cost? Uh, <coughs> that's one of the reasons I'm down. We came and did a uh, did a survey of Coleman Arm. The idea is to do a, a pilot or a demonstration in Coleman Arm. Uh, we, we tentatively, but we'll we'll go back and, and look at it now and see. Uh, we tentatively said it would probably cost about, I think, the rich is correcting, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the first year. No, three years. Three years. No, oh, that's three years. Okay. So it's probably two hundred and fifty thousand in the first year for all the equipment, the insulation, and, and the dosing, and then we uh, we've estimated fifty thousand per year for the next two years. After that, it should, uh, you know, it should once we've got things under control and we have this thing stabilised. That annual cost then uh, comes down because the amount of dosing required comes down. Now that annual cost does it include the electricity to run the pump? Uh, no, I don't think it does. That's what I was trying to. No. So there's an additional yearly cost of electricity. 
So the this 250 is a and the 50 project for Coleman Arm. Hopefully, if this works, we could turn this into more lake-wide treatment. Well, again, that's a lot more money. <laughs> and then, uh, after the third year, what what are the costs estimated? You said 250 thousand the first year, 50 year two and year three. And after that, what happens? Uh, typically, it would probably haul for the next two, and then potentially haul again thereafter. Oh, okay. But well, plus, 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 plus electricity. electricity. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Questions from the audience? Comments? Ah, I got a couple. Richard? <laughs> Hi, Richard. You're okay there. If yeah, as long as everybody uh, can hear. Oh, my name is Richard Lips, uh, from Lake Side. Um, so I've been a uh, biologist down at the lake for the last uh, little bit, the uh, last few years, and I uh, wanted to say that uh, we've looked at a lot of systems over those years and tried to, uh, you know, evaluate uh, something that will help with the algae, and really we've just missed them all uh, mm -hmm. because they don't really uh, address the whole problem. I think this is the first time that I, I feel confident as a biologist that um, this would actually work. It, it's based on essentially changing the food chain from a from the anaerobic kind of stuff that we have now to an aerobic system, and uh, it kind of makes it just makes sense that this would work. Uh, one of the um, my fellow directors at the uh, Oregon Lakes Association, Dr. Wayne Carmichael, has also reviewed this. That's actually where I found out about it, and uh, he. Several emails uh, supporting this and talked to me about it. So I think this has a real good chance of working. Uh, so uh, the only other thing I would uh, kind of address uh, for you folks is, is this idea of how we're going to pay for the electricity, uh, not only for this pilot project, but in the future if we do the whole lake. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we uh, would probably have half the problem with $100,000, uh, maybe even more, to pay for the electricity. So I would suggest uh, we just kind of think about how we can you know, solve that problem um, for the future. Right. You know, maybe another water improvement district like we tried to do last time, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other any other comments? Dick? Well, I think you need to go back to the source of where they thought they'd be pouring you as a septic system. And probably a lot of fertilizer. Well, I think they have it. I mean, honestly, from my perspective, I think you've got a two pronged issue. One is, you know, dealing with the current problem that you have. And then, of course, if you start to make headway on that, dealing with the issue of um, increased nutrients coming in. I mean, I don't see it. I don't see them having to do one before the other necessarily. But, I Richard? I would say that one of the things that TLDP has really focused on in the last 20 years is improving the upland input into the lake. That's sort of been the whole focus of TLDP for the last 20 years. And Mike, you're welcome to just jump in here. But, you know, that, I think we're doing it in the right order. I think we've really, we fenced miles and miles and miles of, of uh, area up there. We've planted riparians. We've done a lot of large woody material. You know, there's things like that up in the, up in the watershed specifically to reduce the input into the lake. So, yeah, we're never going to get it done, but I think we're close to doing what we, we can. Input to that. <laughs> Plus, it's a, uh, you know, it's already a uh, self-sustaining system problem right now because of all the muck in the bottom and right. weeds, etc. Agreed. It's feeding its own. Mentioned. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention is uh, Richard's prepared a little list of companies that he's researched. Okay. If you want that, we can have this reproduced and given to you. Uh, you know, other companies that he has looked at to compare. Sure. That'd be great if you want to send that to us. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Maine, sorry, you're on the phone, and you are the chair of the TLBP, right? Correct. Is there anything you would like um, to say? Um, a couple of questions. 
uh, some months ago we had this uh, presentation at TOBP, and uh, one of the questions wasn't answered was, okay, so the bubbler goes away, goes to, let's say, Shutter's arm instead of Coleman arm. How long does it take, and do they know how long it takes for the algae slash weeds to regrow into Coleman arm? We, we don't know that, apparently. Uh, number two is uh, financing is a huge problem in that uh, there would have to be grants, but apparently there aren't grants for the monthly power charge, which has to be run on a dedicated, as I understand it, 220 system rather than 110 system. Uh, so that power base would apparently have to stay in place or be change to each arm as they go around the lake, depending on how often this bubbler has to go back in that particular spot, let's say, rotation for Coleman arm after so many years. So there's a few questions that need to be answered. And uh, where would the financing come from? Indeed. That's it. Thank you. Dr. Whitney? Part of that answer is there's really no good science to back of moving them around uh, as opposed to just adding more systems. As far as lake goes, we don't know what would happen if we stop it really uh, and how long it would take. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that's why the, the cost to do the whole lake is quite a bit higher. Yeah. And um, it's uh, and plus you have to have yearly addition of the enzymes. Uh, although after the first year plus, uh, that will be reduced considerably, as uh, David mentioned. The Coleman arm is just would be a pilot for three years to see if it works at all for our lake. Right. And then we would be looking at. Uh, if it works, to expand, uh, and we thought we feel that uh, we, once we have demonstrated that it works, that it could be more easily uh, get help to expand it throughout the lake. I agree. I think that's that's prudent. I have a couple of questions. Is the aeration device a floating structure or a submerged yeah. structure? It's in the bottom. It sits on the bottom. It sits on the bottom. You have to run a power line out to it. No, no power. It just uh, air operates on compressed air. Okay. Air lines, but no power. Oh. Well, where's electricity come? Where's electricity needed? On shore. It's okay. The so you power it from shore. So you'd have to have, if you're going to do the whole lake, you got to have certain shore Correct. sites for your your aeration. And how big an area will one aeration device <coughs> handle? <coughs> small ponds that are maybe an acre and five or six feet deep, we might put five or six units in there. But we've done drinking water reservoirs that are 200 feet deep, and one will cover 50 acres. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's, a, it's one of these sort of mm -hmm. on, on the scale. But it's, so depth helps, but you have to design for the, for the, uh, for the shadows. Right. And the shadows time here is on the same size with when the problem is. Any other questions? The other question, I guess, or comment is, is it, the, the, this lake was an important source of coho salmon, was it not? And I, I imagine that run is severely minimized by now. Um, are there conservation dollars available for that? You know, getting, getting the coho runs reestablished is a very important statewide issue. Uh, a lot of, a lot of things you can't do until the coho are recovered, and uh, it, it's bigger than just Ten Mile Lake. Uh, there might be dollars available. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to that. Uh, 
certainly no expert on, on the fish side of things, and not specifically with our cacao, but I was talking to Richard about this yesterday, and in every situation, every environment, be it you know, sort of rivers, dams, on rivers, or isolated lakes, or whatever, the fish life always improves, and, and that's logical. If it's oxygenated, if there's more food, if there's more water for them, uh, you know, biology responds. The, the kind of build it and they will come uh, principle seems to apply. So my expectations, and I, I wouldn't make claims, my expectations are the fish would respond positively. Mike? Hey Mike, we're pretty good, but we can't get the rain stopped. I want you to keep it going. Madam Chair, could you have Mike come to the microphone? I can't hear him. Commissioner Mann can't hear you, Mr. Mitter. Take off no, come your mask. There we go. He has selective hearing. Good morning, Mike. Commissioner Maine. Can you hear me? I can now. I, ha I have my mask on and I'm trying to, I can't see anything. But, um, my question was, is that Timaw Lakes is, is an open system. We have active land uses that we all support uh, with proper management. Um, we have studies, very good studies that show um, that there's lots of dirt coming in. Um, our focus and where we're doing a lot of our sediment abatement is not Coleman Arm at this point. You know, the one question would be maybe a different site that we could look at. Um, but there, I mean, so how do we address when we have, you know, a, a winter storm putting in incredible tons, tons of sediment in the lake? How does your system work with that? <coughs> if, if you're talking inorganic, you know, sand and things like that and so on? Nitrogen and phosphorus inputs. Okay, well, then we, we digest and work that off. So that's exactly what I'm showing you. We, we work that off over time. Over time. That, that's part over of the Okay, so it can, this system, you know, the concern is this going to continue? Um, in fact, they're just active um, timber yeah, harvest, that, that's, that's active the timber situation. harvest getting going in multiple places now. You know, yeah, I mean, that is the typical situation. You have a constant influx, plus you have an accumulated uh, stockpile. Okay. So a big part of the design is to ensure that we not only take care of, of the annual inflow, but we digest the accumulated sediment and start working off the, the stockpile. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good question. Good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Anybody else? Otherwise, we're going to wrap mm -hmm. this up. I assume. I assume the tribe is here because they're at least interested in the topic, or cautiously in favor, and not because you're opposed oh. to cleaning it up. Yes. Water is life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, first place I ever lived in my life was in Lakeside when I was born. And, uh, you know, uh, my youngest kid will be turning 40 or so. When he was young, we used to go to Lakeside and vote. And it was an open reality. You know, and so this is a problem that has been started, you know, from the 1800s when they started logging that area. Like Mike said, all that sediment coming into the lake, and what it's done is it's filled up. And then you bring the, you start getting the weeds in, and every time they die, We need to move forward in, in a positive direction. You know, uh, we're actually uh, going to start having conversations with the EEC and you know, uh, moving that towards the end of the month with uh, Senator Roseland, and then we'll be back here uh, talking to the commissioners along with the uh, uh, water board there at Lakeside and the city of Lakeside are trying to figure out a way to take care of the problem. It's pretty sad when you have six months of the year that you can't, that it's unsafe. I was there, I uh, sent out pictures in January of this year when that green algae was still growing. And that's pretty sad, you know. We need to figure out what's going on. It's, it's not going to be just one thing. Uh, like Mike probably, Mike, probably what Mike was trying to say is, you know, um, the logging, um, the, the stuff that's coming in, you know, we're going to have to put a buffer there so that it, it, it doesn't get into the lake. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Gentleman over there brought up, I think somebody brought up. 
Right. Uh, probably another one, you know, and to, to reinvent those sewer systems. You know, it's not one problem, it's there's four or five big problems, and we need to start on all of them. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, hopefully this time next year we're going to have some consolidation to talk about. Okay. I'd, yeah. Thank you. I think this technology looks very exciting. I mean, we've talked about the inputs a lot and had a work group um, that worked on trying to solve this, but and it's also nice to see some ideas for how, how to solve the issue that's already there. So thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Appreciate yes, sir. Um, I would, I'm very encouraged also and I would uh, offer that we should write a support letter for this project Hopefully, it would help with getting grants for the project. Yes. If you need a support letter, we'd be happy to write one. And um, Commissioner Maine would be happy to be liaison to this project. So we're so grateful that he volunteered and happy for his leadership. Thank you, Commissioner Maine. <laughs> <laughs> and well, yes, and I'm, watch I'm watching you on YouTube. <laughs> huh? Well, that's what I heard. <laughs> uh -huh. Mike was wearing a blue T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, that might have just been a guess. All right. <laughs> Thank you all so much. No, no, no. And we will um, just let us know when you need a letter of support, and we're happy to write one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Thank you. very much. Very exciting. Thank you so much for coming, and thank, thank you, you to all of you for coming, too. All right, we are going to move on to agenda item 3B, request approval of contract with Oregon Health Authority and ratify Mike Rowley's signature. Coos Health and Wellness. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is for uh, COVID-19 funding, uh, 275000 and anything that isn't spent, it's for through December of this year, but it can be carried past that if needed. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the contract? I move we uh, approve the contract with Oregon Health Authority and uh, ratify Mike Rowley's signature for IGA 159806-9. All right. All, second. Okay. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Nope. Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is contract with Columbia Care. This is an extension for our Crisis Resolution Center, and it is to extend it for a year through June 2021. Okay. Do we have a motion? I move we approve the contract with Columbia Care CRC. A second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is a contract with Columbia Care for Bay Apartments. So this is for our transitional housing, and we are extending this another six months through December 2020. Okay. I move we approve the contract extension and ratify Mike Rowley's signature with Columbia Care for Bay Apartments. Right, second. Okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. It's the first of the fiscal year, so we have a lot of contract renewals. <laughs> Um, contract with Columbia Care Pony Creek. Yes, this one is an extension for six months through December 2020, and plus some uh, language change for the payment, but the total payment remains the same, but there is some changes in the language of how we were paying them. Okay. Do you have a motion? I move we approve the contract amendment and ratify Mike Rowley's signature with Columbia Care for the Pony Creek facility. A second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Contract with Columbia Care for Rental Assistance Program. Yes, yeah, this is another extension for uh, a year through June 2021, and it is for a rental assistance program. Right. I move we approve and sign the contract amendment with Columbia Care uh, for the Rental Assistance Program. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then Mike's last one is request reclassification of position. Mike? Yes, this is actually, I think, a two-parter. The first one is to remove Lena from ONA to non-union. Um, she actually is a supervisor, 
and she should have been non-union, I think, a while ago, and this is the first time we've actually been able to get that done. Okay. And the second part is to reclassify her position as a non-union position to pay grade 820, step 6, effective July 1st. Okay. So... I'll make a motion so we can have some discussion. Is that okay. all right? Yes, please. I move we approve reclassification of public health nurse uh, six position to non-union pay grade of 820 effective July 1, 2020 due to removal of this position from the Oregon Nurses Association Union and request that, and also approve resolution 20-06-124P approving the reclassification a public health nurse six, Lena Houghton, to step six of pay grade 820, effective July 1, 2020. Do we have a <coughs> Discussion. Did you want to discuss it? Well, the, yeah, what are we talking about here in pay difference and, and can uh, help me justify uh, the, the increase? Well, this is I think several years in the making that we've been trying to do this. She is actually in the union, but she's supervising the union employee. So we really needed her to be non union. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the first step. And I think last year, or the last time we were in a bargain with the ONA, they agreed that we would look at that this year. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I am not 100% sure what the difference is. I think it's a couple hundred dollars. Caroline? Uh, hi, Mike. It's Caroline. Yeah. Uh, so moving her to step six was the only logical choice. Other, uh, if we moved her to step five, she would actually go down in pay. Mm. And it's right. long been uh, the tradition to um, uh, when we switch someone over to at least put them as close to their original pay as possible so that they do not go down in pay. Um, and so uh, step six was the logical choice. And that increases about how much? It is it's actually only a couple of hundred, but if then if you add in the fact that... A she, month? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you add in the fact that she ha will no longer have to pay the union dues and uh, slightly less cost for health insurance, it, it does increase a little bit. Mm -hmm. But Madam then, Chair, how many, how many people does this position supervise? It currently supervises three staff and one um, temporary VISTA employee. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm fine. Okay. All those in favor? I'll say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, Mike. All right, next up we have John Rowe talking about purchasing galvanized table legs for 100 picnic tables. <laughs> you scared off half our crowd. <laughs> oh, good morning. Good morning. morning, John. Good morning. Yeah, these are in our budget. We want to buy 100 galvanized picnic table legs and hardware. So all we have to do is replace the boards every time they get cut up or wear out. So we had uh, three bidders, and Lois was for 17600 from Rosedale picnic tables. I'm very excited about the idea of you putting new picnic tables in at the county parks. There's a lot that need them. So. Yeah. I move we accept the quote from Rosendale picnic tables and approve the purchase amount of 17000 Six hundred dollars for one hundred galvanized picnic table legs and hardware. Second. Discussion. Nope. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Request approval to purchase new fire rings. Okay, we got another quote for two hundred, but we kept the same quotes from last year, and we still want to go to Jamestown. I mean, they're eleven inch high, and the other. Bitters were seven inch high. We want to keep them the same. These, those are really nice fire. You were happy with the quality yeah, and everything. Really happy with the quality. Good. So. I move we approve the purchase of fire rings from Jamestown in the amount of thirty-two thousand four hundred dollars. How many fire rings is that, John? Two hundred. Then no. next okay. year, 
Next year we'll Thank get you. some more for the uh, tent sites. So, is that a? How many more will we need after this? I yeah. don't know exactly. We're now, doing but great I want to cover all this. the tent sites next. Yeah. Year, so. All right. Discussion. All those no. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Thank Before you. John leaves, may I say something? I, I, John and the park crew have done a marvelous job of upgrading our, our, our parks. Uh, they're looking the best I've ever seen them. I uh, had a really nice compliment from one of our citizens who has camped at 10 mile, I mean, at, ten, at um, Laverne every 4th of July for years, more than a decade. And uh, the comments were that the park has never looked so tidy and neat. They greatly appreciated the, in the new bathrooms, greatly appreciated the work you're doing in, in fencing it off to make it look better. And most of all, they greatly appreciated the fact that we've turned it from Party Central with heavy drinking and lots of noise to a family facility once more. So I know, that's a good please, thing. I want, I want everyone to know that, and I want to thank you and, and your staff uh, for what you're doing. And there's great. still a lot to do. Yeah. But you're, yeah. you're, doing, so. you're doing great, though. That's really nice. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank John. you. All right, next we have Timber and Operation Patrol Services Program. Sheriff. Good morning, Madam Chairman. Good morning. Sit at home, Bob, and Shooter John. Hey. <laughs> I hear things. <laughs> anyway, we're here today on the Timber and Operations Patrol System, the TOPS program. Mm -hmm. the Sheriff's Office has a program for timber patrol services on public and private timberlands in Coos County. 50% of the cost of full time patrol deputy is split among the acreage owned by each of the following subscribers and services. Bavarian Olympus Timber, LC, LLC, Catchmark Timberlands 2, LLC, FIA Timber Gro Growth and Value Master, LLC, Keystone Forest Investments, LLC, Lone Rock Timber Management Company, Mahaffey Tree Farm Incorporated, Moore Mill Lumber Who? Company. Now, hey, mute. Yeah, Bob, you uh, might want to mute your uh, <laughs> Uh, Sorry about Moore, that. Moore Mill Lumber Company, New Growth Olympus LLC, Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon Department of State Lands, Rayner Forest Resources LP, Resor uh, Roseburg Resource Company, and Pacific West Coast LLC. Uh, and we're asking you to approve the contracts for those. So you know the deputy cost divided by two is $53,942.50, and that's covering 272,481.34 acres about 20 cents an acre. I move that we uh, uh, approve and sign the attached contracts and agreements and approve resolution 20-06-119L. Good, good morning. As part of ongoing pay equity analysis and um, uh, <clears throat> just looking at all job descriptions, as I mentioned, I'm going to be on a push this year to, re to continually revise job descriptions, make them uh, become up to date. We decided, Mike uh, Hagen and I decided to update the maintenance worker position to reflect the duties that the position actually performs. Of late, uh, the three maintenance guys are highly skilled and have been taking on more and more duties, particularly doing some construction work over at uh, the Parks Department, and I just wanted to make sure that the job, duty, uh, job description reflected the duties that they actually perform. 
And there's not a change in pay for this one, just a change in job description? Correct. We're just revising and updating the job description. I move we approve the updated job description for uh, building maintenance worker, for the building maintenance worker position. Second. The second. Yep. Discussion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for doing that, Caroline, for taking on that project. Uh, it's something that needs to be done for quite some time, as you know. <laughs> All right. And next we have approval of CBA with AFSCME. Matt. All right. So the current collective bargaining agreement uh, with the AFSCME union. Uh, Expired on June 30th, 2020. This would be a request for the board to approve and sign a new successor collective bargaining agreement uh, that would uh, be effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. I move we approve and sign the collective bargaining agreement with AFSCME dated July 1, effective of, the, of this year uh, and continuing through June 30, 2023. Okay. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. After that is request approval of order adopting recommended changes for Predator Damage Control District and authorized chair to sign letter of agreement. County Council. Okay, so the Predator Damage Control District has recommended uh, charges for the participating landowners for 2020, uh, 2021 fiscal years is set out in the attached resolution and has completed its form LB50 uh, to be submitted to the Coos County Assessor. Pursuant to Oregon Laws Chapter 650, Section 72A, the board must certify the information submitted by the district. And then there's also a letter agreement that we do with the district uh, indicating that uh, we're going to use this, uh, the funds received uh, uh, under a cooperative agreement between us and USDA. Great. I move we approve order 20-06-37L, uh, adopting the recommended charges for 2020-21 for the Predator Damage Control District and directing the district to submit its form LB dash five to the Coos County Assessor and to authorize the board chair to sign the letter agreement. All right. Third. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, sir. As a side note to this, apparently ODF and W is going to cut, it has proposed cutting the support for this program for all the counties in Oregon due to their budget cuts, supposedly. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, for us to uh, write a letter to state that we are in opposition to cutting the support for the damage control uh, problem because it is their animals we're trying to control in the first place. Do you I want think, to deal with this as a late, late agenda item, or? Yeah, let's, I can speak. we'll just add it right after this. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Mom. All right, and I didn't hear any opposed, so motion passes. Uh, do we have a motion to add a late, late agenda item on? I move letter? we uh, add a late, late agenda item uh, regarding animal control. All right, and all second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then Bob, you had, you'd like to make a motion to add, um, to send a letter to ODF and W about opposing cuts to the predator control budget? Correct. Okay. And do you want to second that? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, our next one is a request approval of wildlife services agreement, work and financial plan and authorized chair to sign, Megan. So now that that is done for the Predator <laughs> Damage Control District, this is the agreement between the county and USDA wildlife services. And this is just 
the work and financial plan that we do every year. This is the third year of a five-year cooperative agreement that was approved by the board on July 17, 2018. $10,000 is coming from the County Forest Fund and $75,859.75 from the Coos County Predator Damage Control District. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the work and financial plan and authorize the chair to sign? I move we approve the work and financial plan and authorize chair to sign. All right. Do we have a second? Sure. Yes. Sure. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then, Megan, the next one is yours, too, uh, for giving a loan made from the general fund to the Crime Victims Assistance Fund. So early last fiscal year, we loaned $15,000 to the Crime Victims Assistance Fund. Due to cash flow in that fund, because all of their grants are reimbursement, it, they're having a very hard time paying the loan back. So what I'm proposing is similar to what we used to do with the planning fund when it was in existence, is just having $15,000 of the general fund's money sit in that fund for cash flow, and they will never be able to budget to spend it. It will just sit there to help with cash flow. And that's what okay. the resolution says. I move we approve and sign resolution 20-06-118B. Good to wait a second. All right, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, designation of a newspaper for the annual foreclosure list. Megan. So this is an order that we have to do every year for our foreclosure proceedings for property tax foreclosure. And we did get quotes, and this year the world was cheaper. And so that is what is reflected in the order. Okay. I move we approve order number 20-06-031B. Okay. Aye. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to approve the consent calendar? Move we approve the consent calendar. Thank you, Megan. Second. Discussion? Oh, sorry, no discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. <laughs> Motion carries. And then we are on to agenda item 5A, request award of timber sales, forestry. <coughs> Hi, Kathy. Hi. Morning, Kathy. So pursuant to advertisements which ran in the newspaper, the World newspaper on June 9th and 16th, the timber sale was held on June 30th. Four sales were offered with each receiving multiple bids. Each award, please award each of these sales to Scott Timber Company who was the high bidder in each case. So I did attach a copy of the bid record for you to, um, to look at. Um, Do that, thank you. All right. I move that we uh, award and sign each of the attached timber sale contracts BH-3-20, BH-5-20, BH-6-20, and BH-7-20 to Scott Timber Company at the prices set forth in each contract. Okay. Any discussion? I think we were pleased with yeah. the results of our timber sale this, this year. Looks good. Yeah. yeah. Looks Look very good. good. Looks like things are on their way back up. Good All job. Those, yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And then... You know, I'd like to make a comment here, too. I, th I think timing was very important this year in this. Had, had we made this sale at the time we normally make or these sales at time normally, we would have received considerably less. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it speaks to the work that the forestry department does in, in monitoring uh, log prices and right. lumber and plywood trends. And so yeah. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Pass that on to Much better than April sales. Yeah. So. Don't yes. mention it to Lance. <laughs> complimented it, however. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, discussion regarding the Charleston area transient lodging tax. Nathaniel. Okay. So the board had several work sessions. Uh, oh, God, it had to have been six months ago, maybe, uh, concerning a, a proposed transient lodging tax, uh, which is a short-term uh, rental tax for uh, Charleston and surrounding areas, not for the entire county. Um, so I've been working on drafting up a proposal for what that would look like as far as ordinances are concerned. This would have to be submitted to the voters in the November election. Uh, there's a detail that needs to be worked out under Oregon law. The county uh, retains 30% of this tax revenue and it can be used for any purpose. So it can be, a, it can go directly into the general fund or it can be uh, dedicated for a specific uh, purpose such as providing law enforcement and code enforcement or any other county purpose. So uh, we had some discussions about it potentially going to uh, law enforcement or code enforcement, but I wasn't, I'm not 100% sure. So we yes. need to have that discussion. Commissioners? I, I do recall the discussion about law enforcement. Um, I think I think voters, frankly, are a lot more comfortable approving these if they know where that funding is going to go. If it was me, I'd be inclined to dedicate it towards code enforcement because that's something that has been a big issue in the Charleston area, and um, and we want to ensure that we can continue to provide code enforcement. But I'm I, open I, to discussion. I, I I like that proposal. Thank you, Commissioner Maine. That sounds good. Okay. Well, then you have an answer. So code enforcement. Code enforcement. Uh, my only, not to make this more complicated than these. You know, you're that, about that's, to. That's, yeah, I, <laughs> guilty as charged. Um, I, I just, it, I just, if we if we dedicate it to that, then we need to be sure that we're prepared to spend it. Um, so I know as far as code enforcement officer uh, or deputy, we have one, I think, and yes. then we could, it could also be used for. Uh, mitigating things um, right. so that, that we could find a way to spend it there. Okay. And the sheriff has done a remarkable job for the past six years of making sure that we have a code enforcement officer. But I mean, at times that's, that's right. I know been a struggle because he has a lot of other needs for that officer. Exactly. <laughs> and we've started making some progress on code enforcement in the last, I don't know, six or seven years. And um, I don't know that you could overfund that right hmm. at this moment. So. Fair enough. Uh, and then I think there's one other um, issue that just popped into my head, which was I recall there was a discussion about we have a county park within the area that would be subject to the transient lodging tax. That would be uh, Bassendorf. And there was some discussion about having an exemption for county residents that would stay there. And I don't remember how that, what the answer to that was. And John, I think this was, may have been your idea. I don't think so. It seems like it was. <laughs> oh, <Come on>. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I don't want to accuse you of something. <laughs> I, I think it was something that came up the last time when we had a transient lodging tax on the ballot for the yeah, voters to decide on, time. and I think we yeah. were yeah. addressing that yeah. question. Before that was all things. county yeah. parks. Now it's just a, a couple yeah, or one specific county park. I don't know that the issue is the same. But I'd like to. I believe it's I'm not that. against doing that, but I'd like to look into the difficulty or ease, whichever it turns out to be, of administering a program where we have different rates for different people. Right. Yeah, that'd be a good and, thing to address different the address Parks Department. Okay. I don't think we get a lot of county campers there. That'd be interesting They're, if you they could mainly ask them. From out, mainly from out of the area. Sorry, Bob, I was leaning back. I think Phil had something. Yeah, Phil? Well, I see, you know, anytime you do this, then it creeps over to another one and another one, and another person pretty soon we got all the parts. And people that have already said they don't want this. So I think you're opening a big can of worms. Well, Phil, we were actually asked by the Charleston area to impose this tax. And we said, you know, it has to go out to the voters, and the voters can decide. So the only way it's going to creep that way is if voters decide they want it to creep that way. So it's completely up to the citizens. Well, what I'm saying, though, if, if we do this now, especially on the parks, parks, I guarantee you it won't be five years for we'll either be voting 
or you would just keep the bread to you? Oh, then it's going to get there. I think it's wrong. What do you think is wrong, Phil? Uh, uh, Texans, uh, uh, like the, uh, what do you call it, a uh, lodging tax or whatever you want to call it, against the park, any park, as long as it's up already. Now, you can say, well, the resident can't pay it, but I don't see you here paying it down the road. I'm sorry, I feel that way. We own the park. Well, I hear what you're saying, but based on that logic, you shouldn't have to pay to stay at the park ever. Based on that logic, you wouldn't have to stay to pay at the park ever. And, you know, we already charge people to stay. Well, or do I, I misunderstand? My opinion, and, and no amount of uh, any way you do it would uh, get my approval, but I'm not the only person yeah. sure. that, that's here. I would never go that route. All right. Thanks, Phil. Any, did you have another question? I know. Oh, Commissioner Main, go ahead. Um, I'm just thinking about only qualifying it for code enforcement. Does that code enforcement person, whoever they might be, or person, uh, be excluded from the sheriff's office because currently our code enforcement person is a half-time deputy? So would we be better off to expand it to code enforcement slash deputy sheriff, something like that? Bob, it occurs to me if we just say code enforcement, we can either use it to, we can use it either to help support the existing code enforcement deputy mm -hmm. or to do certain things like what would, what would you use? Uh, clean up properties. Abatements. Uh, abatements. Uses. So right. if, if we leave it open, uh, we have the ability to use it as we best need at the time. Yeah, just bringing up the discussion, yeah. didn't want to get into but, a situation where, well, we have to have a code enforcement officer, but wait a minute, it doesn't say anything about that person being a, a deputy sheriff. Yeah, and, and, you know, uh, public health, or what do you call it, environmental, um, what's your term over there? Health. Environmental, environmental health. health can play a role in, in uh, uh, these issues, too. So it gives us the freedom to, I think, use it in various ways to, to deal with code enforcement. I just didn't want to be hampered by our language. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Matt, are we hampered? I, do, I don't. I don't really see why. I think as long as we're uh, we're being, as long as we can document how we're using that money, and that money is being used to support uh, and carry out code enforcement, and that's what we've said. I, I, I think that I think we'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so you're going to look into the Bassendorf question. Yes, I shall. About like what percentage come from Coos County and how much it would take. Yeah. All right, perfect. Well, it, it, you know, I don't know even if it imposes a burden on our fee collection. So right. I want to look into that. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Matt? No. All right. Do we have any commissioners that have comments that they want to make? Commissioner Main? I, I guess back on the transit lodging tax, we already have a statewide transit lodging tax on everything, county parks, etc. Yes. Yes, we do. Anything else? I, I would like to make a comment that we, we had our first forest fire of the season, a small half acre burn in the county forest Sunday morning? Uh, I thought it was the third, actually. Okay, earlier. I don't. Yeah. Um, so if you're out and about, be careful. Things are dry. Right. You don't know how it started. Uh, but we know it's human caused. Yeah, uh, yeah other than yeah. that. I mean, there were no lightning strikes that day. Yeah. So. I'm not an hour about. Hmm? I'm not an hour about. 
<laughs> so we're going to lock that gate, Phil. Uh, <laughs> that's really all. Um, I, you know, I think we want to remind everybody to continue to wear your masks. Um, numbers are going up statewide. Uh, yeah. Please wear your masks. Um, we will be sending, you know, Coos Health and Wellness to do some education for people. Um, in areas where people don't necessarily know that masks are required. Otherwise, the enforcement is a little patchworky. Um, and generally, if it's not a restaurant, we're encouraging people to call the governor's office to let them know that um, somebody's not in compliance. And I think that's, that's where we're at right now. So thanks, everybody, so much for being here today. And, um, and thanks for wearing your masks. Yep. With Thank that, you. we're adjourned. Do we meet here? Next. I think so. I okay. I think so. That's good because Bobby can hand us our. Oh. On that lodging tax. Yeah. How much of that goes on to?